thank you very much. Uh, as many of you know, my name is Richard Hecht, and I am the program chair of the Taubman Endowed Jewish Studies Symposia here at UCSB. This is our 20th year doing programs in Jewish studies, and I would like to thank two people, really three people, um, who have worked with the program. Many of you know them. First of all, Kelly Coleman, uh, who is not here this evening, um, but she is finishing her doctoral dissertation and soon will be Dr. Coleman. And then also Nikki Eliassi and Garrison, uh, who are our people who support our program. So I want to thank all three of them for their uh, wonderful support. Um, we also have uh, the two most recent books of Edgar Carrot that can be purchased. Now normally, uh, these books would be selling in a bookstore for 15, 16, 18 dollars, but tonight only. Um, we at the Taubman Symposium are selling them for $10 uh, each. Um, so we hope you'll purchase one of the uh, books. We only can take cash or check tonight. If you want a loan, I'll be glad to give that to you, but we want to make sure that we um, allow this wonderful writer, Edgar Carrot's work to become um, known further in uh, Santa Barbara. So it's a great pleasure um, um, to welcome to our campus and our community, uh, I think one of Israel's most interesting writers, Edgar Carrot. Um, I'm not going to try to repeat everything that's in the program brochure, but simply to comment on a few interesting aspects of his career. Um, he was born in Ramat Gan in Israel in 1967 to Polish parents, both of whom were survivors of the Holocaust. Um, he told me over lunch um, that he is very popular in Poland, so popular or perhaps beloved by the Poles who consider him to be Polish first and then second an Israeli writer so loved in Poland that someone actually built him um, a narrow, a very narrow house, which has been recognized by the Guinness Book of World Records as the thinnest house in the entire world. Um, he, of course, many of you know that his short stories have been translated into more than 40 languages. And uh, in, in Iran, where his books are smuggled in, the Iranian government uh, thinks that Edgar Carrot really doesn't exist, but is a fabrication of the Israeli Mossad so as to lead Iranians into political and religious confusion. I want you to know that that's not true. And in a moment, you're going to have the opportunity to enjoy, I think, one of the most interesting uh, writers uh, at work today. In fact, the, uh, the fact that Edgar Carrot uh, and his stories are read everywhere means that Edgar Carrot is more than just simply an Israeli treasure. He's really a treasure to the global world. Some of you uh, may uh, have noticed that he's becoming somewhat of a regular fiction writer for The New Yorker. So, the uh, 15th of November, uh, excuse me, 15th of N uh, May issue, which will arrive for us with uh, subscriptions on Thursday or Friday of this week, has another story of his entitled Fly Away that he may tell us about this evening. One last note. On Thursday night of this week, Edgar Carrot will receive the Charles Brofman Award in New York City. Here is the description of that award. The Charles Brofman Prize celebrates the vision and endeavor of an individual or team under the age of 50 whose humanitarian work combined with their Jewish values has significantly improved the world. The goal of the Brofman Prize is to recognize dynamic leaders whose innovation and impact serve as inspirations for the next generations. So I think you're in a moment going to have a wonderful treat with Edgar Carrot. So please join me in welcoming Edgar Carrot. Thank you. Good evening. 
Uh, I must say that uh, I've arrived to the U.S. Uh, from Mexico, uh, where I just uh, published uh, my first collection of short stories that I started writing uh, 30 years ago. And going there, I couldn't kind of help going back in this kind of a time machine uh, to the time where I, I first uh, began writing. Uh, I began writing during my uh, compulsory army service in the IDF in Israel. When you're 18, you have to join the army for three years. And I come from a lineage of horrible soldiers. You know, my great-grandfather was a bad soldier in the Tsar's army, and it got worse ever since through the generations. And when I joined the army, I, I basically I got kicked from four different units. Uh, I remember one of my officers was a, a religious man, you know, with a yarmulke, and he said to me that being a, a, a believer, he believes that every human being or animal or plant were created for a reason. And he said, you know, you served here for three months, and I can't figure out why God had created you. <laughs> he said, you must have some kind of divine intelligence to understand that. But in the end, the army discovered that I was good at one thing, and that was uh, computers. So uh, uh, they sent me to this computer unit where I, I would take a very long shift, 24 hours, sometimes 48 hours. And during the sh those shifts, I would be to almost totally isolated. You know, it was kind of pre-internet time, pre-cell phone time. And I would sit in this kind of basement, you know, with very st uh, strong uh, AC and uh, basically do what people do when they're left in solitary confinement and they talk to myself and do all kind of strange things. And one day I found myself sitting next to one of the computers there and writing uh, what seemed to be a story. I printed it out. It was one page long. I really wanted to show it to somebody, but I had to wait for something like 20 hours for my first potential reader who was this really like tough soldier, you know, who came to relieve me from my duty. And I said to him, listen, I wrote this thing. I think <laughs> So um, I took this printed page and kind of went outside of my army base looking for a reader, you know, and they would always change shifts around 6 a.m., which is a bad time to look for readers. And very quickly, I found myself taking a bus to my older brother apartment house, and when I got there, I buzzed his intercom, and uh, he answered in a sleepy voice, and I said, listen, I wrote this story, I really, I must have somebody read it, I really want you to read it, can I come up? And he said, Look, you woke up my girlfriend and she's really angry, so how about I come down with the dog and I read the story while walking the dog. And that sounded fair enough, so I waited for him. He came down with his little dog and the dog was really excited because it wasn't used to being taken out on walks so early in the morning. And he already started kind of digging in the sand and contemplating where he relieved his doggy urges. But my brother was more into story reading, so he kind of grabbed the page from my hand, and he started reading and walking. The dog tried to fight, you know, but it's big brother, small dog, not a real fight, and I see how the leash kind of uh, uh, pulls him on one way, but he tries to go on the other, and very soon he kind of falls on the side, and as my brother goes reading the story, dogs keep, start going boing, 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 you know, on the sidewalk. And uh, it was a big dilemma because I'm a big dog lover, but my brother was reading the story. I didn't want to bother him. And luckily for the dog, you know, my stories are very short. So, so two or three blocks later, my brother stopped. The dog regained his balance and was able to do what he wanted to do in the first place. And, and my brother looked at me with moist eyes and he said to me, I can't believe my little brother had written this. It's beautiful. And then he came and hugged me. And then he said to me, do you have another copy of it? And I said, sure. So he bent down and he picked the dog poo <laughs> with the printed page. And, and it was that moment where I realized that I want to become a writer. <laughs> because in a very st strange manner, I think my brother was telling me something. And I think what he was trying to tell me was that the story was never in that printed page. You know, the story was in my heart and in my mind. 
And that page was no more than some kind of a pipe, you know, that I could spill whatever I had in me or in my soul into him. And right now, you know, this uh, piece of paper was covered in dog poo and was thrown into a bean. But when I looked at my brother, you know, the story was still there in him. And I realized that, you know, that I was onto something and that maybe that thing could help me survive the rest of my compulsory army service. So here's the story I wrote exactly 30 years ago. And uh, I brought a clean copy <laughs> out of respect to the audience. And it's called Pipes. When I got to seventh grade, they had a psychologist come to school and put us through a bunch of adjustment tests. He showed me 20 different flashcards, one by one, and asked me what was wrong with the pictures. They all seemed fine to me, but he insisted and showed me the first picture again, the one with the kid in it. What's wrong with this picture, he asked in a tired voice. I told him the picture seemed fine. He got really mad and said, can't you see that the boy in the picture doesn't have any ears? The truth is that when I looked at the picture again, I did see that the kid had no ears, but the picture still seemed fine to me. The psychologist classified me as suffering from severe perceptual disorders and had me transferred to a carpentry school. When I got there, it turned out I was allergic to sawdust, so they transferred me to a metal working class. I was pretty good at it, but I didn't really enjoy it. To tell the truth, I didn't really enjoy anything in particular. When I finished school, I started working in a factory that made pipes. My boss was an engineer with a diploma from a top technical college, a brilliant guy. If you showed him a picture of a kid without ears or something like that, he'd figure it out in no time. After work, I'd stay on at the factory and make myself odd-shaped pipes, winding ones that looked like curled up snakes, and I'd roll marbles through them. I know it sounds like a dumb thing to do, and I didn't even enjoy it, but I went on doing it anyway. One night, I made a pipe that was really complicated, with lots of twists and turns in it, and when I rolled the marble in, it didn't come out at the other end. At first, I thought it was just stuck in the middle, but after I tried it with about 20 more marbles, I realized they were simply disappearing. I know that everything I say sounds kind of stupid. I mean, everyone knows that marbles don't just disappear. But when I saw the marbles go in at one end of the pipe and not come out at the other end, it didn't even strike me as strange. It seemed perfectly okay, actually. That was when I decided to make myself a bigger pipe in the same shape and to crawl into it until I disappeared. When the idea came to me, I was so happy that I started laughing out loud. I think it was the first time in my entire life that I laughed. From that day on, I worked on my giant pipe. Every evening I'd work on it, and in the morning I'd hide the parts in the storeroom. It took me 20 days to finish making it. On the last night, it took me five hours to assemble it, and it took up about half the shop floor. When I saw it all in one piece waiting for me, I remembered my social studies teacher who said once that the first human being to use a club wasn't the strongest person in his tribe or the smartest. They didn't need a club, well, he did. He needed a club more than anyone to survive and to make up for being weak. I don't think there was a human being in the whole world who wanted to disappear, to disappear more than I did. And that is why it was me that invented the pipe, me and not that brilliant engineer with his technical college degree who runs the factory. I started crawling inside the pipe with no idea about what to expect at the other end. Maybe there would be kids there without ears, sitting on mounds of marbles. Could be. I don't know exactly what happened after I passed a certain point in the pipe. All I know is that I'm here. I think I'm an angel now. I mean, I've got wings and this circle over my head, and there are hundreds more here like me. When I got here, they were sitting around playing with the marbles I'd rolled through the pipe a few weeks earlier. I always used to think that heaven is a place for people who've spent their whole lives being good, but it isn't. God is too merciful and kind to make a decision like that. Heaven is simply a place for people who are genuinely unable to be happy on earth. They told me here that people who kill themselves return to live their life all over again. 
because the fact they didn't make it, did, the, because the fact they didn't like it the first time, doesn't mean they won't fit in the second time. But the ones who really don't fit in the world wind up here. They each have their own way of getting to heaven. There are pilots who got here by performing a loop at one precise po point in the Bermuda Triangle. There are housewives who went through the back of the kitchen cabinets to get here, and mathematicians who found topological distortions in space and had to squeeze through them to get here. So if you're really unhappy down there, and if all kinds of people are telling you that you're suffering from severe perceptual disorders, look for your own way of getting here. And when you find it, could you please bring some cards? Because we're getting pretty tired of the marbles. And so after the army, I basically, during my entire army service and during my university years, I kept writing. And at some point, uh, one of my professors at, at, I, who had seen my writing had offered me to publish a book, my first collection. And when the collection was ready from the publishing house, they sent me this kind of back cover text, you know, where it was written, a new voice in Israeli literature. And I tried to explain to them that I tried to do something very different with language and with lens, and that I tried to write those very minimalistic texts. Uh, but they said to me, listen, we have two options. You're either a new voice or a pillar in Israeli literature, and you can be a pillar only after your, after your third book. So you're a young voice, you're stuck with that. And I kept arguing because I was kind of like a, I'm an arguing kind of guy. And uh, they said to me, you know what, you can write the, the back cover text yourself. It only had to be very short, like this short. And I had a few weeks to think about something, and it was Hanukkah, a, a Jewish holiday. And I thought to myself, wow, I'm going to have a book out soon. I'm artistic, I'm creative. And at the moment, I decided that I'll build my own menorah, you know, the lamp where you put the candles on in the Israeli holiday. And I was living in this uh, rented apartment, and the tenant before me left some of his children toys. So I took all those kind of Power Ranger puppets and made this uh, menorah out of them, and I was very proud of myself for being so original. And I lit the first candle, and I was very happy to see it lit. Uh, but I was more ambiguous when I saw the menorah catching fire. And I was totally against it when I saw that the table was burning. But I didn't lose my cool, and I kind of brought a bucket of water, and I put out this little fire. And in the process, I inhaled a lot of smoke, and I'm asthmatic. So I found myself in the ER closest to my home. And uh, this very... George Clooney, like, doctor came to take care of me. Like, he was very handsome and very charismatic and very happy with himself. And uh, he came to me and said, okay, son, tell me, tell me, uh, tell me what happened. And I said to him, I built this menorah out of plastic. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, son, you don't have to tell me everything. Tell me only the important stuff. <laughs> and I told him, I can't breathe. And he looked at me again, he said, see, that was easy. <laughs> and then he got me this in inhalation mask, and you know, in kind of, like in a few moments I was feeling better, and he checked my pulse, and the moment he was sure that I was kind of out of danger, he left me and went to patronize other patients in the ER. Uh, and he forgot his prescription uh, n uh, notebook behind him, and uh, I wrote this text that became the back cover text of my first story collection. When you have an asthma attack, you can't breathe. When you can't breathe, you can hardly talk. To make a sentence, all you get is the air in your lungs, which isn't much, three to six words if that. You learn the value of words. You rummage through the jumble in your head, choose the crucial one, and those cost you too. Let healthy, people, let healthy people toss out whatever comes to mind the way you throw out the garbage. When an asthmatic says, I love you, and when an asthmatic says, I love you madly, there's a difference, the difference of a word. 
and a word is a lot. It could be stop or inhaler. It could even be ambulance. So uh, the, the truth is, I, I basically, I was, I'm supposed to talk about my latest book, but I never do what I'm supposed to do, so. And my latest book is basically a memoir. It's called The Seven Good Years. And it talks about the seven years be between the birth of my son and the death of my father. Uh, I think that the, my parents, you know, both being Holocaust survivors, uh, this idea of continuation was very important for them. You know, for my mother, who was uh, often during the war, uh, the fact that she couldn't show her children to her parents, the fact that she couldn't feel that she's kind of part of a lineage that still exists was something that I think that always made her sad. Uh, and so the seven good years were really those kind of seven blessed years where I could be both a son to my father and a father to my son. Uh, I, I think that, you know, that uh, only when I sat down to write this book, you know, and maybe say goodbye to my father, I wrote all basic, basically most of those pieces in real time, so I wrote a lot of them while he was dying. I realized that, that when, when you, I'm a writer, you know, I go on interviews, I always say, we, uh, who was the writer who influenced you the most? And you pick a name, you know, in my case, it's Kafka. Uh, but that, that's kind of the easy answer because basically what made me the writer I, I am was my family. And that long before I've read Kafka or any other stories, uh, my first uh, meeting with stories were the bedtime stories that my parents W uh, had told me. And in our home, it was really strange because m my parents, each of them spoke uh, six languages. Uh, we, the house was full of books, but we had no children books because my mo one of my mother's uh, sweetest early memories were her parents telling her bedtime stories in the ghetto. And in the ghetto, there was no access uh, to books, so they would have to make her up a new story for her each day. And for her, this was really the most uh, deep way of them showing uh, their the love to her. And she said she, it always felt very special because she was very kind of attentive knowing that the story that she hears will be told only once and only to her. So if she won't listen, the story would be lost. So she was kind of, she had to keep it and catch it. And, uh, and she wanted to do the same for her children. And she knew that she could buy us a children's book at the store nearby, but for her, kind of buying us a book and reading from a book was the equivalent of buying us a pizza instead of making us a fresh dinner. It's, for her, it was something that a lazy parent does. You know, a kind of a good parent prepares a new story for his children each evening. And she was a very good storyteller, and I really loved her stories, but sometimes she would work late, and then my poor father would have to tell us stories without any books, and my father didn't know how to invent stories. So this was more kind of a documentary kind of <laughs> stories. Basically, he would tell us about stuff, he would tell me about stuff that had happened to him. And uh, in a strange way, I liked his stories even better. Uh, they always had all kinds of extreme things in them that didn't seem kind of to be right. But there was also a sincere attempt, like almost a Jewish Hasidic attempt, to advocate for the people in the story, to try and understand them, to try and accept them, even if they did stuff that they were not supposed to do. Uh, and the stories of my father, they always uh, had one thing in common. They always took place in a whorehouse. <laughs> and, uh, and the protagonists in the stories, they were always uh, prostitutes, mafia guys, and drunk people. And when I asked my father when I was four or five years old, what's a prostitute, he thought for a moment and he said, well, a prostitute is somebody whose work is to listen to other people's problems. And when I asked him what's a mafia guy, he said, well, you no, know, mafia guys are those kind of people that collect rent even from apartments they don't own. <laughs> and when I asked him what's drunk people, he said, well, it's people with these physical conditions that the more liquid they drink, the happier they become. 
And very early on, in, during, when I was in kindergarten, I had my first professional, professional dilemma because I couldn't make up my mind if when I grow up I want to become a drunk prostitute or a drunk mafia guy. Uh, but when I reached the age of 9, 10, I realized that what my father was telling me wasn't true. And I confronted him and uh, I said to him, you, you, look, I know what a prostitute really is, and you were telling me stories that you you're not supposed to tell a kid. And my father who never tried to kind of to hide or, or to kind of wiggle his way out, and he said, look, it's really simple. I'm not like your mother. I can't make up stories. When I was with you in bed, my first instinct would be to tell you stories about my young days, but what, can I, what story will I tell you about how me and my parents hid in a hole in the ground for 600 days, not being able to lie down, not being able to, to sit only, to stand only sitting. And that when the Russians liberated our, our small town, you know, they had to pull us up because our muscle had contracted, or should I tell him a story about how my sister went out of our hiding and got caught by the Nazis and was tortured to death but refused to say where, where we were at? These are not good stories to tell a kid before he goes to sleep. So I fast forwarded my life a little until after the war when I really yearned to come to Israel. And, uh, and I thought maybe I can tell you that, but that wasn't a good story either because the British had caught me when I got to Israel and deported me back to Europe. And after that, you know, I joined the Irgun, which was an organization that had fought the British occupation. And uh, they asked me to f find a place that would be willing to sell them firearms. And I found myself very quickly in southern Italy buying we weapons from the Italian mafia. Uh, and because I didn't have any money for myself just for those deals, the mafia people took pity on me. And they let me stay without a rent in a whole house they owned. And I lived there for more than six months. And it was the first time in my life where I didn't have to hide the fact that I was a Jew. I could sleep full, full nights without waking up in panic. And the people around me, you know, weren't always nice. You know, some of them were killers. But compared to the Nazis, they were okay. And I thought to myself, you know what? Maybe I can tell you stories about those times. And I think that, you know, that those stories that my father had told me, they kind of put some kind of the foundation of what I thought that stories are like. You know, I think when you're a kid, everything that you see, you try to understand its function. And uh, you see some kind of a, a machine, a button, you want to know what can it do, what is it good for. And I think that what I kind of realized in a very early age from my father is that the role of stories is basically to advocate for human beings, you know, to try and not to beautify their actions, but to try to find a way to empathize with them and be with them, even when they do things that maybe they shouldn't have done. And I guess that this, this is something that stays in my stories to this day. So I wanted to read uh, to you one of the chapters in the memoir because uh, uh, when I had a din dinner with Richard and uh, other uh, distinguished uh, guests and donors, uh, we talked uh, a little bit about uh, about Poland and my connection to Poland, you know, and and uh, I thought maybe I'll read this chapter about Poland and about my mother, and it's called the uh, Jam. The waitress in the Warsaw Cafe asks if I'm a tourist. The truth is, I tell her, pointing to the nearby intersection, my home is right there. It's surprising how little time it's taken me to call the 47-inch wide space in a foreign country whose language I don't speak home. But that long, narrow space where I spend the night really does feel like home. Only a few years ago, the idea sounded more like a silly prank. I got a call on my cell phone from a blocked number. On the other end of the line, a man speaking English with thick Polish accent introduced himself as Jakub Szczeczny and said that he was a Polish architect. One day, he said, I was walking in, on Chod, Chodna Street and saw a narrow gap between two buildings, and that gap told me that I had to build you a house there. 
Great, I said, trying to sound serious. It's always a good idea to do what the gap tells you. Two weeks after that weird conversation, which I filed away in my memory under unclear practical jokes, I received another call from Szczechny. This time it turned out he was calling from Tel Aviv. He'd come here so that, he, that we could meet face to face because he thought correctly that I hadn't taken him seriously enough during our last conversation. When we met in a cafe on Ben Yehuda Street, he gave me more details about his idea of, a building, of building a house for me that would have the proportion of my stories, as minimalist and small as possible. When Szczechny saw the unused space between the two buildings in Khordna Street, he decided that he had to build a home for me there. When we met, he showed me the building plans, a narrow three-story house. After our meeting, I took the computer simulated picture of the house in Warsaw to my parents' house. My mother was born in Warsaw in 1934. When the war broke out, she and her family ended up in the ghetto. As a child, she had to find ways to support her parents and baby brother. Children could escape from the ghetto more easily and then smuggle food back in. During the war, she lost her mother and little brother. Then she lost her father, too, and was left completely alone in the world. She once told me many years ago that after her mother died, she told her father that she didn't want to fight anymore, that she didn't care if she died, too. Her father told her that she must not die, that she had to survive. The Nazis, he said, want to erase our family name from the land, and you're the only one who can keep it alive. It's your mission to get through the war and make sure that our name survives so that everyone who walks down the streets of Warsaw knows it. Not long after that, he died in the Polish uprising. When the war ended, my mother was sent to an orphanage in Poland, then to one in France, and from there to Israel. By surviving, she fulfilled her father's request. She kept the family and their name alive. When my books began to appear in translation, the two countries in which, somehow surprisingly, I became more successful as a writer were Poland and Germany. Later, confirming perfect, perfectly to my mother's biography, they were joined by France. My mother never went back to Poland, but my success in her native land was very important to her, even more important than my success in Israel. I remember that after reading my first collection in Polish translation, she said to me, you're not an Israeli writer. You're not an Israeli writer at all. You're a Polish writer in exile. My mother looked at the picture for less than a fraction of a second. To my surprise, she re recognized the street immediately. The narrow home would be built totally by chance on the spot where a bridge had linked the small ghetto to the larger one. When my mother smuggled in food to her parents, she had to get past the barricades there, manned by Nazi soldiers. She knew that if she was caught carrying a loaf of bread, they'd kill her on the spot. And now I'm here, at the same intersection, and that narrow house is no longer a simulation. Near the bell, near the bell there's a sign that says in big brush letters, Dom Kereta, the carrot house. And I feel that my mother and I have fulfilled my grandfather's wish, and our name is alive again in the city where almost no trace of my family is left. When I come back from the cafe, waiting for me at the entrance is a neighbor, a woman even older than my mother, holding a jar. She lives across the street, heard about the narrow house, and wanted to welcome the new Israeli neighbor with some jam she made herself. I thank her and explain that my stay in the house will be limited and symbolic. She nods, but isn't really listening to me. The guy I asked on the street to translate her Polish into English stopped translating my words and says in an apologetic tone that he thinks she doesn't really hear too well. I thank the woman again and turn to go into the house. She grabs my hand and launches into a long monologue. The guy translating into English can hardly keep up with her. She says, the guy tells me, that when she was a girl, she had two classmates who lived not far from here. Both girls were Jewish, 
And when the Germans invented, invaded the city, they had to move to the ghetto. Before they left, her mother made them two jam sandwiches and asked her to give them to her girlfriends. They took the sandwiches and thanked her, and she never saw them again. The old, old woman nods, as if confirming everything he's saying in English. And when he finishes, she adds another few sentences, which he translates. She says that the jam she gave you is exactly the same kind her mother put in the girl's sandwiches. But time has changed, and she hopes they'll never force you to live here. The old woman keeps nodding, and her eyes fill with tears. The hug I give her scares her at first, but then makes her happy. That night I sit in the kitchen of my narrow house, drinking a cup of tea and eating a slice of bread and jam that is sweet with generosity and so with memories. I'm still eating when my cell phone vibrates on the table. I look at the display. It's my mother. Where are you, she asks in that wor worried tone that she used to have when I was a kid and was getting home from a friend's, was, get, was late getting home from a friend's house. I'm here, mom, I reply in a choked voice, in our home, in Warsaw. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, so maybe uh, the last story I'm going to read, it, it's kind of like, a, for me it was kind of like a bridge, a bridge story because it was uh, the last story I wrote in my last story collection before the memoir. And it's basically a fictional story about my family. So it was kind of a good way to, to, of transit, you know, to write this story and right after that move to the real stories about my family. So this story is, is called, What Animal Are You? The sentences I'm writing now are for the benefit of the German public television viewers. A reporter who came to my home today asked me to write something on the computer because it always makes for great visuals. And also writing. It's a cliche, she realizes that. But cliches are nothing but an unsexy version of the truth. And her role as a reporter is to turn the truth into something sexy, to break the cliche with lighting and unusual angles. And the light in my house falls perfectly without her having to turn on even a single spot. So all that is left is for me to write. At first, I just made believe I was writing, but she said it wouldn't work. People would be able to tell right away that I was just pretending. Write something for real, she demanded, and then, to be sure, a story, not just a bunch of words. Write naturally, the way you always do. I told her it wasn't natural for me to be writing while I was having my picture taken for German public television, but she insisted. So use it, she said. Write a story about just that, about how natural it seems and how the unnaturalness suddenly produces something real, filled with passion, something that permeates you from your brain to your loins or the other way around. I don't know how it works with you, what part of your body gets the creative juices flowing. Each person is different. She told me how she'd once interviewed a Belgian author who every time he wrote had an erection. Something about the writing stiffened his organ. That's the expression she used. It was probably a literal translation from German, and it sounded very strange in English. Right, she insisted again. Great, I love your terrible posture when you write. The cramped neck, it's just wonderful. Keep writing, excellent, that's it, naturally. Don't mind me, forget I'm here. So I go on writing, not minding her, forgetting she's there, and I'm natural, as natural as I can be. I have a score to settle with the viewers of German public television, but this isn't the time to settle it. This is the time to write, to write things that will appeal. Because when you write crap, she's already reminded me, it comes out terrible on camera. <laughs> My son returns from kindergarten. He runs up to me and hugs me. Whenever there's a television crew in the house, he hugs me. When he was younger, the reporters had to ask him to do it, but by now he's a pro runs to me, doesn't look at the camera, gives me a hug, and says, I love you, Daddy. He isn't four yet, but he already understands how things work, this adorable son of mine. 
My wife isn't as good, the German television reporter says. She doesn't flow, keeps fiddling with her hair, stealing glances at the camera. But that isn't really a problem. You can always edit her out later. That's what's so nice about television. In real life, it isn't like that. In real life, you can't edit her out, undo her. Only God can do that. Or a bus if it runs her over. Or a terrible disease. Our upstairs neighbor is a widower. An incurable disease took his wife from him. Not cancer, something else. Something that starts in the guts and ends badly. For six months, she was shitting blood. At least that's what he told me. Six months before God Almighty edited her out. Ever since she died, all kinds of women keep visiting our building, wearing high heels and cheap perfume. They arrive at unlikely hours, sometimes as early as noon. He's retired our upstairs neighbor, and his time is his own. And those women, according to my wife at least, they're whores. When she says whores, it comes out natural, like she was saying turnip. But when she's being filmed, it doesn't. Nobody's perfect. My son loves the horse who visit our upstairs neighbor. What animal are you? He asks them when he bumps into them on the stairs. Today, I'm a mouse, a quick and slippery mouse. And they get it right away and throw out the name of an animal. An elephant, a bear, a butterfly, each whore and their animal. It's strange because with other people, when he asks them about the animals, they simply don't catch on. But the whores just go, just go along with it. Which gets me thinking that the next time a television crew arrives, I bring one of them instead of my wife. And that way, it will be more natural. <laughs> they look great. Cheap, but great. And my son gets along better with them, too. When he asks my wife what animal she is, she always insists, I'm not an animal, sweetie. I'm a person. I'm your mommy. And then he always starts to cry. Why can't she just go with the flow, my wife? Why is it so easy for her to call women with cheap perfume whores, but when it comes to telling a little boy I'm a giraffe, it's more than she can handle? It really gets on my nerves, makes me want to hit someone. Not her, her I love, but someone. To take out my frustration on someone who has it coming. Right-wingers can take it out on Arabs, racists on blacks, but those of us who belong to the liberal left are trapped. We've boxed ourselves in. We have nobody to take it out on. Don't call them whores, I read it to my wife. You don't know for a fact that they're whores, do you? You've never seen anyone pay them or anything, so don't call them that, okay? How would you feel if someone called you a whore? Great, the German reporter says. I love it. The crease in your forehead, the friends I had key strokes. Now all we need are an intercut with translations of your work in different languages, so our viewers can tell how successful you are. And that hug from your son one more time. The first time he ran up to you so quickly that Georg, our cameraman, didn't have a chance to change the focus. My wife wants to know if the German reporter needs her to hug me again too. And in my heart I pray she'll say yes. I'd really love my wife to hug me again. Her smooth arms tightening around me as if there's nothing else in the world but us. No need, the German says in an icy voice. We've got that already. What animal are you? My son asks the German, and I quickly translate into English. I'm not an animal, she laughs, running a long fingernails through his hair. I'm a monster, a monster that came from across the ocean to eat pretty little children like you. She says she's a songbird, I translate to my son with impeccable naturalness. She says she's a red-feathered songbird who flew here from a faraway land. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, uh, Edgar wants to have a discussion with us. And the way that we have to do that is we have to use the microphones that are on stage right and stage left. Um, so, uh, if anyone wants to ask him a question or make a comment about writing, uh, his work or anything else, please come to the microphones. Who's going to be first? Well, the, the, don't, you, you can't all rush at the same time. So you have to come up to the you have to come to the microphone. And the reason is that this is all being. Um, uh, prepared for University of California Television, and we want to get your comments in his discussion. I get edited out. You get uh, to be in the 
uh, account of tonight. So who wants to ask the first question? We have it over here. I have a question. Um, since your writing is so spare, uh, do you cut out a lot? Do you, do you revise by removing a lot? Uh, yeah, oh, well, I think that the, my stories always become shorter from the first draft. I think that the, there are a lot of things that you need to write, you know, just to get a story going or to figure it out, but they don't always have to, to stay there. It's a little bit like when you bake a cake, you got those scratched edges, you know, that you cut off, you know, and you need them for baking, but they're not good to eat. And usually, let's say, one of the first thing I do when I finish a draft, I try to read the story without the first paragraph. And many times it works, so I can't cut the first paragraph off, and then I try to read it without the second paragraph. And then I keep on going until the story doesn't make any sense and I stop, but I realize that many times, like this first paragraph is something that it's like kind of, you need to accelerate to get to the right speed. And the first paragraph is the acceleration stage, you know, so you can really give it up. And there are many other things that I f find that uh, when I write the first da draft, they're almost kind of like explaining the story and you don't really need them, you know, so, so actually it, there is this kind of feeling of relief when you can edit and you cut things out, you know, and you wish you could do it in your real life, you know, kind of cut out all the boring, less important part of it and, just stay where the juicy action part is. Any more questions? Do you want people to see on tapes that you're shy? <laughs> May I ask two questions? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit more about your father, is one, and the other is, uh, what's the worst part about being a writer? Uh, what's the worst what? The worst part. Ah, okay. Uh, so, but my father, you know, I can really, I think this book, I wrote almost an entire book about him, but I can tell you something that I remember very strongly, and it's also something that I think kind of made me a writer, that when I was young, they t gave us as a school project to write uh, about our parents. And I really wanted my father to come up good, and my father was a real character. After surviving the war, he said, I, I don't want to live one life, I want to live many lives. So every seven years he would change his profession. And sometimes like, he would work at, at things that he would be good at and would be making good money. And sometimes he would work at things that he would be really bad at and would be very poor. So like this question of coming to father saying, Dad, are we poor now or are we well off? And he said, oh, we're well off. Okay, so buy me that, you know? So uh, so I, when I had to write this piece about my father, I thought, I asked my father, what's the thing that he's most proud of, like from all the things that he did? And then I write my essay about that, so I make him look good. And he, when I asked him that, he thought about it seriously. And after thinking about the lot, he said, well, you know, I think that the, thing I'm most proud of is that since I came to Israel, I fought in five wars, all of them as a, in the infantry, like a, as a soldier, always in the fir first line, and I never hurt anybody. And when I was a kid, like I said, I can't write anything about that. It means that he's a bad soldier. What kind of a soldier? Like, why should you be proud of kind of fighting in so many wars and not hurting anybody? But as I grew up, I understood that I want to be like him. And I guess since I didn't know how to fight wars without hurting anybody, I, the only way I knew how to do that would be actually writing, you know. I think writing is a good way to fight wars without hurting anyone. As for the worst part of being a writer, I must say I've yet to discover that, you know. I really think that the, the writing only did good things for me. I think it, uh, it helped me tackle my loneliness. It helped me learn a lot of things and accept many things about me. It helped me. I think that there is something about it that when I started to write, my writing had some kind of a confessional value, you know, like a Catholic confession. Like, that basically, I want to write on the page, listen, I'm really weird and I have all those kind of weird ideas in my head and I'm not like other people and 
and I kind of had to take it off my, get it off my chest, you know, and when I started publishing stories, people came to me and said, we know exactly what you're talking about. So basically, there was something in the writing experience that helped me kind of accept myself, and I'm very grateful to, to my writing for that. I wanted to know how you would orchestrate your time for writing. Um, like for a month, how would you start your week? How would you say you would, how much time you would do it? What time of day you would do it? How many hours you would put in? Uh, well, I must say I'm, very, I'm a very disorganized person and I like always do kind of many, many things together right. and I can't, Oh, I can never be in a hierarchy about the things that I do. They all seem to me kind of equally urgent and important. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, I'm a lot with my son. I take care of my mother. I'm a professor in university. I, I like to write fiction, but I also like to write scripts for films and to direct for films. So I really don't have any writing routine. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that I see kind of writing stories in my, in my head, it's almost kind of an evolutionary model. It's like every day I wake up and I, and I have this idea for a great story. And then like after three or four weeks, you know, the one idea that stays, that is able to survive is the one that I sit down and write. Uh, I, when I teach in university, I always say like to my students, you know, don't end up like me, you know, do better, because I really think it's very important to block yourself time like every, every day if you can, if not a, few, a couple of times a week, in which you just sit down and, you know, even if you don't have anything to write, you just bore yourself for a couple of hours and something will come out of it. But I'm, I'm good at preaching that, but I'm not that good at doing it myself. Do you work on many projects at one over a period of time? Yeah, like, like, like you know, it, w on the flight here, I tried to, I tried to count on how many projects I'm working parallelly, you know, and about, you know, when, when I've reached 15, we, we've landed, you know, so, so maybe there are some more that I kind of, I forgot. Hi, I have a question. Um, when you think of the person you were when you wrote Pipes, how do you think you've changed the most since? And how do you think that your success as a writer has changed the person you were since then? Well, it's a good question. It's a very, it's very complicated to answer. I can say in one aspect, you know, that when I wrote Pipes at the time, I used to stutter. And I think the reason I started was that whenever I would start a sentence, I would think that, you know, I would expose myself, you know, that people would figure out that I was too weird, you know? And I think that all this kind of thing of writing stories, publishing them, seeing people identify with them, I think that what I realized very quickly, that it's not that I wasn't weird, it's just that everybody else was weird too, but they were much better at hiding it than I was, you know? And I think that, the, that it really helped me interact with other people and uh, it helped me be more sincere and talk about myself. And I would go almost to the lens of saying that it saved my life, you know, because when I wrote Pipes, I was, I was in a very, very bad uh, emotional uh, situation. Uh, as for success, you know, it's funny because I can give two contradictory answers. You know, one of them is something that my brother told me. My brother once, uh, he, li he lived in Thailand, and he once went to an island there, and he read all my books, like one after the other. And he said, you know, in your first book, you have uh, many stories that takes place in a bus, in a bus. In the second one, you have many stories that takes place in a, sex in a taxi. And in the third one, you have many stories that takes place on an airplane. And he said, if somebody follows your books, you can see that uh, socioeconomically, your situation keeps improving, <laughs> but somehow your life stays as difficult, you know? It doesn't matter where you are, if it's in a bus or in an airplane, there's always somebody sitting next to you and it always ends badly, you know? Uh, but 
I, I think that, you know, I think that I always had this kind of fear from success because I always had this feeling that, that not only story, but life themselves come from kind of a friction that you have with it, you know? And I guess that's why, even though kind of I'm a writer, I always experiment with other forms, like, you know, filmmaking, uh, dancing, uh, children book writing, just to kind of create this friction, just to go a little bit away from my comfort zone. But I remember this experience that, you know, that uh, when I was out of the army, me, me, me and my two best friends, uh, we lived in Tel Aviv, and there was this kind of a club that was really like the fanciest club, you know, best music, prettiest girls, and like every weekend we would kind of dress really nice and go to the club. And I don't know how it is in the US, but in Israel you have this kind of thing that there, there is a guy standing in the, at the entrance and he kind of looks you up and down and then he says, it's a private party, you can't come in, you know? And basically like every week we would kind of dress up, you know, and go there and stand there in the line and everybody would be in and when we come we say, private party, sorry guys, can't come in. And we go to, there was a, a kind of a 7-Eleven kind of store on the other side of the street, we would go and buy beers and sit on the sidewalk and drink beer and look at all the kind of fancy people going in. Uh, and then when, like one weekend, it was just after I published my first story collection, uh, we went there, we stood in line, the guy looked at us and said, sorry, private party. And as we were going away, the owner of the place was running after us and says, hey guys, hey guys, come in. And when we got there, we said to the guy at the entrance, don't you know who this guy is? It's Edgar Carey, the writer, come on. What? He says, come with me. And he took us and he put us on the bar. And he told the waiters there, or the bartender, he said, whatever they want, you give them, it's on me. And we were there, like, you know, and it was really good music. And like, drinking, you know, scotch, you know, the most expensive one. And the three of us, we were really, really depressed, you know, while we were doing it. And then one of my friends said to me, I guess you're not going to write any more stories about people who try to enter club and don't, are not welcomed, you know? And, and I guess that really, I really always had these fears that, you know, that uh, my life would get too comfortable. But I must say that, you know, I'm neurotic and stressed enough to, to challenge that and to, and to make even the easy life uh, very difficult. Uh, I think you'll agree with me that this has been an absolutely delightful evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely delightful. Now, let me remind you that um, if you haven't purchased one of our books, um, the two uh, collections of short stories, Vedkar Carrot, um, uh, Garrison's going to be at the, uh, uh, in the foyer with them, and we're going to bring out a table and uh, Edgar will sign your books.